to talk a little bit about some of your influences in life. As, you were, as you've come up and you've built your framework on how you look at business, how you look at leadership, how you look at the economy, what are some of the, say, authors or thought leaders that had big influences on you? Well, my parents had a big influence on me, and the, the main influence was to try to be authentic to who I was, uh, say what I believe, uh, don't be afraid to uh, be yourself. I, other than that, I didn't really have a framework, honestly. Probably the most, the closest thing I had to a framework is I had little devices to try to be myself. Pretend I had a lot of money. Uh, pretend I have a limited number of years to live. Pretend I could do anything I wanted, and then is this really what I would do? But other than that, it wasn't until years later, probably in hindsight, that I was able to put a little bit more structure around what I did. So when you look at the economy today, and when you look at uh, all the different influences, where do, you, where, where do you start? And I say, where do you start? Where do you start in the data that you consume? Mm -hmm. And then where do you, uh, what are your next steps? You cons you're consuming data. How are you consuming data? Especially mm -hmm. as a CEO of the Fed, mm -hmm. uh, I assume that a lot of that is word of mouth data. So I come at this as a business person. Mm -hmm. And so if you asked a business person or asked you in running your business, boy, you're running Chatham, you must look at data, revenues, all this stuff all the time. You say, well, yeah, some, but I look more quality of our people, trends with our clients. You look a little bit more at what I would call drivers mm -hmm. as well as data. I try to do the same thing with the economy. So yeah, I look at all the data releases and you could get, you could drown in all the data releases. There's one almost every day, the Commerce Department has put PPI, CPI, jobs numbers, claims, you name it, I tend to look at drivers, and in that regard, there are five drivers, and I, I update this with the world changes, there's five big drivers I watch. Demographic trends, mm -hmm. particularly labor force growth trends, the world's aging. We used to have too many, word we had too many people, now I worry we're not gonna have enough workers. Technology-enabled disruption and the impact that has on businesses and on workers uh, and on, um, uh, people in, in terms of skills training and their education. Globalization trends, which have now become deglobalization trends, and that's a very big development. The energy transition. I wouldn't have said this five years ago, but I'd say it today. The transition from a fossil fuel-based economy to one that reduces, limits greenhouse gas emissions is probably the most significant transition economically going on globally. So I watch that very carefully. And then the last thing I look at is, I call it, as stealing this from George Soros, the end of the debt super cycle, is that a lot of these trends didn't matter for most of our life because we used leverage to mask them. China has used leverage to mask the fact they've got an aging problem. You know, overinvestment. Uh, we've used government debt to, uh, do tax cuts, stimulus, which kind of in some ways distorted the underlying strength of the economy. We are now so highly leveraged as an economy, I think we may be close to the end of the debt super cycle, meaning if you're gonna grow in the future, you gotta grow the workforce and improve productivity. But those are the five trends I look at and how those trends are developing tell me a lot on what's going on. And then one example would be Today, as we're sitting here, the 10-year Treasury has backed up over 100 basis points over the last, you call it, four to six months. That's a monster move. Why is that going on? I don't think it's because we have such a booming economy. I think it's because we are highly leveraged and the world is saying, gee, with all this supply of Treasuries coming and no sign you're going to reduce your deficit spending, maybe we need to get paid more for treasuries. That's an example of a structural trend uh, uh, that I look at more. That The structural trend tells me more about that development than does the current data. Okay, so let's, let's follow that thread for a minute and let's dig into it a little bit. Last time we spoke would have been, uh, I think, six to nine months ago, and it was really before the unwinding and the quantitative easing uh, right. started to happen. Right. I think that the Fed's balance sheet had gotten up to about $9 trillion. We've seen about $750 billion, I think, get unwound, more mm -hmm. or less. Um, you were warning that that's probably the canary in the coal mine. People want to mm -hmm. talk about the Fed raising rates, but it's actually the unwinding of this balance sheet or the end of the debt cycle that may be the bigger driver of things. 
as you've watched that start to happen, anything you're noticing specifically on the speed of that, the velocity of that, whether, whether it will continue? So I think when we talked, it was before the March blow up of Silicon Valley Bank mm -hmm. and First Republic. So um, the, the QE becoming QT, quantitative tightening, the Fed runoff, takes away one large buyer of treasuries, mm -hmm. okay? The banks were another very large buyer of treasuries. Uh, uh, the big banks in particular have parked a lot of money in hold the maturity accounts in long duration, either treasury or treasury related securities. I don't need to tell people as we sit here now, that caused the failure of two large banks and it reduced capital for a number of others. The, the banks are not buyers right now of long duration treasuries. Japan is now unwinding yield curve control. It, that on the margin also reduces another potential buyer for treasuries. And so again, we're running, we ran in 2023 close to a $2 trillion deficit, which people kind of yawn over, but if you look at it as a percentage of GDP, it's probably the largest post-crisis, we're not in a war, mm -hmm. pre-recession deficit in our lifetime. And what all that's happening, and the Fed runoff is contributing to this, is uh, buyers of treasuries are starting to demand, it's not that we won't buy treasuries, we will, we gotta get paid more. Mm -hmm. And uh, the QT is a contributing factor to that. The other thing QT is doing is draining bank deposits. Right. A lot of people think the bank situation has calmed down. Under the surface, when I talk to bank CEOs, they on margin understand that the Fed drain its balance sheet is draining deposits. The Fed building its balance sheet contributed deposits. So I think it's one reason why banks are tightening up credit and realize that they may lose more deposits and they're bracing for that. So that credit tightening up banks is a, is a really interesting dynamic and in how it's playing. So we can go down a couple different threads here. Uh, but I've watched a few, a few things happen. One, um, the Fed would have thought higher interest rates probably would have uh, popped some of the bubble in residential homes. But as I look at the data right now, what they've popped is the transaction volume of residential homes, although oddly price of residential homes in certain areas continues to go up because interest rates jumped up so fast. If you own a home, you can't afford to refinance or sell the home, which is making the supply of homes much smaller. And with a small supply of homes, if you want to go and buy a home, there's now way more, it's just supply and demand imbalance. Uh, I think that's one of the things that was probably an un, uh, unanticipated consequence of watching rates go up so high. Yep. Uh, the other one that I worry about that you mentioned here is banks' credit tightening. Mm -hmm. So when banks' credits tighten, and, we, and, and especially the regional banks right now, a lot of these economies are going to be driven heavily by credit in the regional banks. Um, what's going to replace regional, uh, what's going to re replace credit in the regional markets? So let me start first with the banks, then we'll go to what's going on in housing. Yeah. So people have to remember that if you're a big company, if you're a big S&P 500 company, there's a good chance you have access to the capital markets mm -hmm. for debt, which means uh, you, other than for working capital loans, you may not actually have much reliance on bank debt, unless you do a big transaction yeah. where, you, where you need to borrow. So that means the big companies tend to be more sensitive to access to capital in the public markets. The kinds of companies that are very sensitive to uh, bank capital, obviously the real estate sector is very right. sensitive to bank capital and small businesses. And if you talk to a typical small bank, those are the two flavors they have. They have commercial real estate exposure, usually in their, in their area, geographic area and they have a lot of small business loans, so-called CNI loans. Uh, the, what the banks are doing because of this situation is tightening up their lending to small businesses and they're being very careful about their extension of new credit on real estate. What I, 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 worry, I, I worry less about the real estate situation because it, it, it's a market and it'll tend to reprice. I mean, that doesn't mean people won't lose a lot of money, but, but 
but it'll, it, the market will work. I do worry a lot about how tough it is to run a small business today in the United States. And, you know, restaurants, a lot of businesses we don't even think about that need working capital lines and usually depend on their local bank. That line is tougher to get and to keep. And a lot of the job creation, which we're not as worried about right now because the job market's so tight, but over the horizon, small businesses create a lot of jobs in this country. And right now that muscle is getting atrophied because small uh, businesses are having a harder time getting capital and small banks are having a hard time. And, and I think, let's say there are 4,150 banks in the United States. Only a, a less than 100 or, or over 20 billion in assets. I would guess that 10 years from now, there'll be a thousand less hmm. small to mid sized banks. They won't fail, but they will merge. And I can tell you those conversations are actively going on right now. The only thing that's stopping them is if you do a merger, you got to mark your hold the maturity account to mark it if you're being acquired. And nobody really wants to do that. But, but there's once you once we get things settled down you'll see a whole range of small to mid-sized banks disappear and that may reduce access mm -hmm. for small business so then what will replace it a lot of people say private credit the problem with private credit is it tends to start at 12 to 14 percent uh, maybe with warrants and most small businesses can't shoulder that kind of rate and so the truth is, what's the other alternative? Equity. Remember equity? You know, they have to put more equity in your business or expand more slowly, or better yet, retrench if you're a small business. And I think that's what's going on right now. On the housing side, to your point, people forget Fed running off its balance sheet and raising rates cools demand. But there's another, as you pointed out, there's another side of the equation. There's supply. We've got a very tight labor market. We can talk about why that is. Uh, it's hard to get capital. If I want to build a house, let's say I want to build a spec house, I got to borrow money. I've got to find workers. I got to get materials. Uh, it's very risky. If it's a contract, you know, where I know that there's a buyer, that's a different matter. But it's not a surprise that you're not getting uh, builders who tend to be regional in small towns, are very hesitant. The ones I talk to are very hesitant to borrow money, assemble a plot of land or plots of land, and they're struggling to hire workers. And so supply and permitting is difficult. And so the, the supply issue is really a significant issue right now. And that's the part maybe people hadn't anticipated as much as they might. Uh, so I want to ask some practical questions about uh, your advice to leaders right now, especially leaders who have to deal with interest rate, uh, interest rate risk. From my perspective, I have watched how much psychology plays into interest rates and into managing expectations. So when rates first jumped up, uh, there was a constant drumbeat of, well, the yield curve's inverted, rates are going to go down again. Uh, and now what I keep hearing is, well, rates are 5%. Um, but they can't stay 5% forever, so we'll have to kind of live through the next 12 to 24 months and they'll come back down to normal levels. What are normal levels for interest rates? What if 5% is a normal level for interest rates? And if you are running a business where you do have to take out debt, how, how does one protect themselves uh, uh, with interest rate risk and with both the risk of can I get liquidity, but if I do get liquidity, the expenses of the liquidity? So I talk to business leaders every day and my most and individuals and portfolio managers too. And for business leaders, I, I give them all the same advice. This is not the time to be swinging for the fences in a new capital project or expansion or gee, we're gonna take on more debt because gee, we're, we're just about at the worst of this. This is the time where you wanna be stepping up and taking more risk. I don't think so. And I'll explain why I think this is a period to uh, to not be a hero, but to survive. And, and secondly, to your point, there are a number of businesses I talk to that are far more leveraged than they think they are. And what do I mean by that? Is to me, the test of whether you're over leveraged is not can you make it through based on the current economy, do a downside scenario. Right. Can you make it through that scenario? If the answer is no, you got too much debt. And 
as painful as it may be, you need to find ways, including equity or other things, to deleverage now so you can make it through a downside scenario. I'm confident that businesses, depending on the industry, are going to have a great future over the next number of years if you're prudent and get through the next two or three years. And I think that's the most significant advice I give to people, but do that downside scenario. Then ask yourself, do you have too much debt in that scenario? And the answer is, well, that scenario is never going to happen, or I thought we've actually been through the worst of it. I don't think we've been through the worst of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do I think is going to happen? And I don't know, but the scenario I think is most likely. I think the reason the economy is as resilient as it is, and, and this is saying that while you know a lot of sectors, good sector, other sectors, feel like they're in a real estate, think they're in a recession right now, but the service sector is very resilient. I think the reason for the resiliency is all this government deficit spending, Inflation Reduction Act money, Infrastructure Act money, and hundreds of billions of unspent American Rescue Act money at the mm -hmm. state and local level. That money will eventually dissipate. Okay, so there's good news and bad news with that. When that money dissipates, the bad news is I actually think the economy may well slow. Mm -hmm. That is when you may see the unemployment rate start to go up. Uh, and for businesses, you have to anticipate. You think you've been through the downturn? We may have a downturn coming, but it may not be for a couple of years, but it's coming. The good news is I do think the natural level of short rates I'd be very surprised if three years from now the Fed funds rate was five and a quarter to five and a half or whatever it is. I would guess it's going to be in the threes. And the reason I say that, inflation, you call it two and a half to three percent. And the real Fed funds rate, X inflation of a half to three quarters. Mm -hmm. So three, somewhere in the threes. The rate that I'm not as sure is going to come down three years from now is the 10 year. Because let's assume the Fed funds rate is three and a half at 150 basis point. You pick the term premium. Mm -hmm. That's a 5% 10 year. Kind of feels to me the curve of the future is going to be short rates, 200 basis points lower. And I hesitate to predict where the 10 year is going to be. But, but if inflation is sticky at two and a half to three, it wouldn't shock me, you know, if, if the 10 year stays sticky. So is you're running your business, you might get some relief on the short rate, but be aware that may come with weaker demand in your business than you have today. It's not going to come with our business is booming and the short rate is three, three and a quarter percent. That Listen, that may happen. and I'll right, be thrilled right. if it does, but I wouldn't bet my life on it. So you touched on inflation there, and let's dig into Let's unpack inflation a little bit mm -hmm. because I find inflation to be on the one hand incredibly simple because I could recreate inflation in a game of Monopoly with 10 people right here <laughs> and show you how inflation works. At the same time, it is, from my perspective, the most misunderstood part of the fixed income markets that we have. Uh, inflation at the moment, it certainly feels like the Fed and monetary policy is working at somewhat odds to the government and their fiscal policy. I agree with you. Uh, and I'm not sure, you know, a quick question is the uh, Inflation Reduction Act when I read that act, that seems like an act to increase inflation, not reduce inflation, right. despite the headline. Yeah. So let's take that. The Inflation Reduction Act, when it was passed, was supposed to be deficit neutral, and there were all these pay-fors and a whole range of things, including 86,000 new IRS agents, and the thought was tax collections might actually go up. Mm -hmm. So far, what's happened is the Inflation Reduction Act has had a bunch of credits that people can either take up or not. I, I think already on the take up side, I'm told by people who look at this and look at their analysis, we're already three or 400 billion over budget on a trillion dollar bill. And at the same time, tax revenues year over year are lower, not higher. The IRS agents that they were talking about never did get hired. Mm -hmm. So that's a nice way of saying the pay fors have never materialized. So this, at the moment, may change in a few years, is being deficit financed. The Infrastructure Act was supposed to be deficit neutral, although even the CBO didn't think that was the case when it got passed. That's clearly deficit financed. And so to your point, uh, the fiscal spigot is wide open. 
Now, for those who say, nah, it's not that material, you know, look at the size of the deficit as a percentage of GDP. When the year started, for example, in 2023, I think the best estimate I saw on the deficit was going to be $1.1 trillion. Mm -hmm. It's ended the year closer to 1.8 or 1.9. That delta, whatever, six or seven hundred billion dollars in a $26 trillion economy, it's over 2 percent. Sounds pretty significant to me. And so I do believe, and I agree with you, monetary tightening is being offset to some extent so far mm -hmm. by fiscal spending. The issue is um, it may not continue. There may be action in Congress that tamps it down. Uh, eventually, you'll deploy a lot of these bills, and it'll eventually dissipate. The unspent ARPA money will eventually dissipate. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to have to live with reality. And the reality is going to be, though, you may be dealing with, two years from now, a trillion dollars of interest expense as part of the national budget, right? That right now it's 600, 600 right. 625, but the debt's going to all reprice. So time is not our friend. If, if we continue to have a resilient economy for two more years, a lot of the federal debt is going to reprice at these higher rates. And I would guess the front page story most days or most weeks is going to be about that trillion dollar interest expense that's not only crowding out discretionary spending, it's crowding out every bit of spending, and we're going to have a national discussion about what do we do about this. Well, when I look at the uh, at the federal budget, so you're right, we, I think the stats are we have about a third of our debt rolls in the next 12 months. Uh, it's all going to get repriced significantly higher. Uh, if you think about your budget by categories, obviously you have to make your interest payments, uh, you have entitlement payments, and you have defense payments, which we'll get to in a second, but probably we don't want to... Uh, Likelihood is we're that. not going to be cutting defense no, right probably now, not. which leaves only a very narrow sliver for other uh, for other payments to which we even could cut at the moment. Right um, now, I can make two arguments on this kind of uh, dichotomy between fiscal and monetary policy at the moment. I can make an argument to say, you know what, it's actually creating a soft landing. So monetary mm -hmm. policy is giving us a squeeze. Mm -hmm. Fiscal policy, I'm giving enough money. Uh, locally to keep people employed. Mm -hmm. that, That's true. That maybe in the next two years, in the short run, this it's true. won't be as bad. Unfortunately, I can also make an argument to go, hey, this is a funny way to delay pain. Mm -hmm. So then two years, it's going to be terrible. Yeah. Um, I think both arguments are correct. In the short run, which remember, we're in, in this country uh, where the attention span is very short. If, the, if we don't have a recession this year or next year, that may, some may call that a soft landing. But I think, and I think the most likely outcome will be mm -hmm. both of your arguments. 23 and 24, I think the surprise will be how tight the job market is, how strong the consumer is because they're employed, and how resilient the service sector is, the economy is. Go to 25, 26, the government spending is going to dissipate. Mm -hmm. A lot of these higher rates, to your point, are going to be already embedded because we had to roll our debt. And I think you're going to see demand weaker, and we're going to have a chance to see how this economy really performs without the artificial stimulus it's receiving. Right. And my guess is you're going to see a severe weakening then. My worry is, then what do you do? We, we won't have much fiscal powder or capacity because we're using it pre-recession. The Fed can cut rates, and that will have some positive effect, and I think they will. Uh, but, but I think it may be a more challenging period to get through. Now, by the way, this is one scenario, and you and I, it may not turn out this way, but if I were a business person, uh, your job in life is to plan for these kinds of scenarios. Right. Uh, one last question on inflation. So inflation is still running higher than expected, right? Everybody has their own views, and I think inflation, not only is it misunderstood, it's highly politicized. Mm -hmm. uh, so everyone wants to talk, either inflation is terrible or it's great, but mm -hmm. often that has more to do with their political views mm -hmm. than it does with the actual numbers. Right. Can, in your opinion, can our country run uh, at 3.5% inflation uh, year after year after year? Or what level gets too high? I know the Fed is saying 2%, and I know everyone's comfortable at 2%. Yeah. But how long can you compound growth at inflation at 3 or 3.5%? So 3 here's what is happening now. 
and in Europe it's, it's worse. Mm -hmm. We've got two structural factors. We've talked about one, fiscal spending, although it's not being widely talked about, is offsetting some of the monetary tightening and I think is keeping inflation sticky, particularly mm -hmm. in the service sector. You got one other structural factor, and I talked about one of the, the energy transition. Right. We are, we are structurally undersupplied globally on fossil fuels. What do I mean by that? We're producing uh, 13 million barrels a day in the United States. If we wanted to, although it wouldn't be easy, we could produce more, but we are three to five years away from peak oil demand. And most of the work I see is even with an aggressive energy transition, we are undersupplied. And God forbid if there's a geopolitical event that, you know, that shuts down oil production somewhere in the world, we'll be even more undersupplied. And that gasoline, we're not as sensitive to gasoline prices as we were in the 70s, but we're still sensitive to it. And that worker who makes $50,000 a year, or 55000 and there's 50 million of them, and we don't have enough of them, mm -hmm. they're saying they got to drive to work. They don't have mass transit often. They got to drive to work and they got to fill up their car, and they need to get paid more. It's no coincidence that you're seeing labor actions in a range of industries where workers are trying to repurchase, or reclaim purchasing power. What do I mean by this? If inflation stays at three, three and a half, this wage price dynamic is going to get more firmly embedded, and you're already seeing it, meaning I'm getting paid more, but I can't make ends meet. And at three, three and a half inflation, the headline is three and a half, but for people making 55 grand a year, their share of wallet for rent, energy, healthcare, mm -hmm. and food is higher than for more affluent people. And if the inflation rate headline is three, three and a half, it might be six or 7% for them. Right. Okay. And it's not working. They can't make ends meet. And they're making tough choices every day. Um, and therefore, when they go, if they have a bid away, they're going to be much more receptive to a bid away, not because they want to leave or they're disloyal. They just can't make ends meet. So I think the longer inflation stays high, the more embedded this wage price dynamic becomes to where it's hard then. Uh, the, the horse, as they say, has left the barn, and it's harder to get it corralled. That's the issue. And one of the things I've always appreciated about your views, especially in the Fed, was that you have been willing to talk to the elite, to uh, the business, the uh, partners at law firms, to the heads of investment banks, and say, you are not the economy. The economy actually is made up by the middle class, and it actually is made up by what you're, what you're talking about now. If you magically could uh, both chair the Fed and make fiscal policies right now, what are two or three things that you would do to try to Ease, ease the tension here. Here's what I would do, and this is going to be ex probably very unpopular. I would slow down the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act. Mm -hmm. Okay, meaning don't spend as much in 23 and 24 on these new projects. Slow it down. Keep some dry powder for down the road if we have a downturn, because this is potent stuff from a you know, fiscal stimulus point of view. Because, correct me if I'm wrong, right now a lot of it is uh, spend it or lose it. Well, here's the uh, here's let's take them in pieces. The Inflation okay. Reduction Act works tends to be public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. Usually, 75% of the money is a private firm, 25% of the money is the government. But that project, what CEOs are telling me, without the 25%, we wouldn't spend the 75%. Right. Okay, and and I and I want I, if we're ever going to do this project, I want to do it while we can get the 25%. So I want to do it now and not wait. So I'd say slow it down. The Infrastructure Act, slow, very important, slow it down. I think they've already announced 300 billion of infrastructure projects since it was passed. Slow it down, we don't have the workers. And then on the unspent American Rescue Act money, say to the states, you know what? You, the rule was you have to obligate it by 24, spend it by 25, mm -hmm. we're gonna give you five more years. Mm -hmm. Good news, you still have to do it, but we're gonna widen it. And most states would breathe a sigh of relief because I talk to state officials every week who say, God, I do not feel good spending this money, but what am I supposed to do? If I don't spend it, we're going to lose it. Right. Everybody will be happy. There's one more thing, which will also be difficult. We should have a national initiative to produce 3 million more barrels a day. That might have been easier three years ago. Very hard now. You mean you'll need more, more refineries. Mm -hmm. You'll need different permitting. Uh, gets better you'll have to go to the financial industry 
and say to the big financial holders, we've got a national imperative to produce more. Right now, the financial industry is saying to oil and gas companies, you want to keep your job? We want you to only drill out of cash flow and we want you to return capital. And by the way, the industry's gotten used to it. They don't mind it. Prices are higher. Right. Okay. So it's not music to their ears to say, we want you to produce more. Prices are going to be lower. Your business is probably going to be less profitable. And if you're a shareholder, may not be as good an investment, but we have a national priority. It will take an integrated plan with some resistance to make that happen. But what would it do? It's likely to lower the price of oil and gas, reduce the pressure on that middle class family, mm -hmm. probably put some cold water on this wage price spiral. And so those are the those are four actions I would take if I could. Okay. So if it's not hard enough to run a business today it, with the local economy happening, we also have this overlay in our entire ecosystem of uh, world disruption. Um, I'm going to give you two extremes on what's happening in the Middle East right now. I actually recently just finished a suspense book that I was reading. It's a fiction book on suspense, and the premise of it was written about 18 months ago. The premise was this. Um, Russia attacks Israel, but makes it look like it's Iran, so that the whole world looks at Israel and Iran, so Russia can continue taking over Ukraine, and China can take over Taiwan. Uh, obviously, that that author got some things right, but that seems like that's the beginning of World War III. Mm -hmm. The flip side of this, though, could be we've had a regional conflict and crisis in this region for thousands of years, mm -hmm. um, and it can be contained, if, if, if things go right, it can be contained to this region. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask you a pine on which one of those two is mm -hmm. right. I am going to ask you a pine. If you are a leader in a business today, mm -hmm. how much thought should you be putting into that greater world stage, and what should you be watching for on on decisions that you need to be making? So, uh, the long and short of it is, uh, the war in the Ukraine, the war in the war right now, the conflict in the Middle East, are quote unquote as horrible as they are, are manageable from a mm -hmm. world economic point of view if they don't expand right if they do expand then all of a sudden I would guess business activity globally will take a step down all mm -hmm. right price of oil might actually unfortunately in the midst of that go up mm -hmm. not what you want uh, as a business person your job is not to be psychic in other words you're not supposed to <laughs> predict the future with it but your job is to run scenarios and make sure you make it through that downside scenario. So my advice to business people is that isn't a crazy, that first book you read mm -hmm. is not a crazy scenario. Make sure you're prepared for it. Make sure you're prepared that your demand for your product or service takes a step down. Oil prices or gasoline prices may actually go up in the midst of that. I would guess there'll be a flight to quality. Mm -hmm. This is maybe a little bit of silver lining. There'll be a flight to quality, I would guess, in the short run. Rates, despite everything we've said on rates, might tend to be lower rather than higher. Um, make sure you survive it. And if you say, well, we wouldn't survive that, but it'll never happen, and the reason, if the reason you won't survive it is you're over leveraged, take this opportunity. You may not think these are stable times, or good times. In hindsight, they may look like stable times. Take this opportunity. If you can't, if you can't, you can't, to take some chips off the table and make sure you make it through the downside scenario. Mm -hmm. So when we've had big times like this in the past of crises, of, uh, of uncertainty, often one of the positives that's pulled us out of this is technology. Uh, technology. We advance on different technology fronts yeah. and it makes us more efficient. Yeah. Um, what are your hopes for what we could see in technology That's, over the next five to ten years? I have no doubt that that will happen. So I would say two things have happened. We had technology-enabled disruption that made businesses more efficient. We had globalization was a tool businesses used, maybe overused, mm -hmm. to outplace goods, services, workers. Uh, technology-enabled disruption is alive and well, and I think if anything is accelerating. So we'll have that, mm -hmm. except we, workers will need to be trained and retrained. The literacy will be more at a premium, and we are lagging. I would rather the government spend a lot more money on education of hu and human capital skills training, mm -hmm. early childhood literacy, 
because to take advantage of this technology evolution, there'll be plenty of jobs, but you'll need to be literate and you'll need to be adaptable. Um, the other thing that we used to use in addition to those two was, and if all else fails, we got a big stimulus coming. Uh, tax cut, spending. I mean, w w whether we know it or not, we always kind of knew it's, it's coming, right? It's coming, you know? And right, and I think in this next one, unfortunately, it may not be coming. Not because we don't want to, but if the 10-year Treasury, and we're worried about the, the debt as a percentage of GDP and interest as a percentage of the deficit, we just may, we just can't do it. And so then we're gonna have to work through this by growing the workforce, improving productivity, do it the old fashioned way, fundamentally. We're actually not that used to that. Right, right. And, and I'm with you, that is one of my fears, is while the Fed may have a bazooka, if it has no ammunition for the bazooka, how scary is a bazooka with no ammunition? Uh, tax cuts, it's hard to look at the deficit and go like, we can throw in tax cuts or even uh, do quantitative easing. I don't think we're going. We can take quantitative easy. I think we played those cards. Well, the problem with quantitative, so rate cuts, fair enough. Yes, that's that's fair enough. Quantitative easing, you have to remember what's the impact of it. Fed already has an enormous footprint in the treasury market and the mortgage-backed security market, and that's a nice way of saying, it, to some extent, it's distorting the pricing me mechanism right. somewhat lower. As the Fed runs off and we sort of get off the anesthesia, you're seeing what the impact is. Things are repricing and it doesn't feel very good. You hate to think that the antidote for what we're gonna head through next is more distortion. That's what QE will do. It distorts the pricing mechanism. I think as painful as it may be, be it might be a lot healthier to live with the real treasury price and adjust our activities and our government spending to adjust to reality. This anesthesia has in effect given a license to us. Fiscal spending, no problem. Rates are low, just spend it, spend it. There are some, I won't mention names, prominent economists who in the New York Times are saying, these people talking about the deficit and debt, they're like, you know, debt scolds, whatever you'd call them, you know, like, ah. And you know what? They're right until they're wrong. Right. And I think uh, we love to invite these distortions, but I think we'd be healthier. Like if you're an individual, if I hurt my leg and you keep giving me medication, but it masks the pain that's really there and structural problems, wouldn't it be healthier just wean off that stuff and we'll go through the rehab, and, but let's get to a better place. I think we'll be, we'd be in a better place in this economy if we did that. So last question for you is if you suddenly um, had to invest on behalf of uh, an entity you liked, a foundation, and they asked you, where, would I'm, where am I gonna put my money for the next five to 10 years? Where are you gonna put it geographically, where you fixed income, equities? Like, how does your mind approach that problem with everything that's, uh, everything you're looking at right now? So if you've got a 50, first question I ask, what's your time frame? Mm -hmm. If you're saying, I want you to invest on my behalf and I'm gonna need the money in five years, that would, that would auger for, and I, and I, and I by the way, uh, I'm involved in an organization like that where mm -hmm. we have a big excess, but we spend it down. That's straight for Richards Kaplan. Um, uh, shorter maturities, realize you forego the upside, but we need liquidity. Okay, so that's one question. If it turns out it's a big institution that we're not gonna need the money for 50 or 100 years, I would say have a, have a policy allocation to global equities, U.S. equities, some alternatives. Uh, I'd probably be careful about taking too much duration risk, but if you see rates get up above a certain level, even be prepared to nibble at the longer end, again, if you have a longer time frame, if you have 50 to 100 year time frame, which some institutions do, and I've been on the board of some that have that time frame, then realize we're gonna go like this and look over the horizon and try not to be too clever. Okay, I said that was the last question, but one more. Mm -hmm. um, what do you say to, to people who go, this is the beginning of the decline of the American empire. There's lots and lots you can take back to mm -hmm. how Rome, you know, how Rome falls over time, but, but they look at America and they say, look, mm -hmm. we're, uh, we're overextended on mm -hmm. uh, uh, money-wise because of our budget. Mm -hmm. We're overextended on military-wise. Uh, military uh, 
the, there's too much dissension with, mm -hmm. our, with our people. What's the... So that brings me back, you asked what, what are the frameworks I look at. So right. I tend to look at a framework which I've developed after I, after I got to Harvard Business School that talks about what do you do that's distinctive, mm -hmm. what are your priorities, and where you're out of alignment. And in, in that type of scenario, I'd be going back to basics. What makes the U.S. economy in the U.S. country distinctive? Our people. Our people. Our quality of our people. Their education level. Their ethics. Their hard work. You know, all those things. And I'd be looking to use our scarce resources to build our human capital. I'd probably have a conversation nationally about, about legal immigration that's sensible and controlled. We, one of our distinctive competencies as a country is we've been a magnet for talent. My parents, my grandparents were not born here. They were born elsewhere. Many probably the same for most people listening to this. Let's get back to basics and invest in our human capital. Mm -hmm. That's the most important thing we can do. What's made this country great? The culture of our country, the quality of our people, our ability to band together, work together for the greater good. Uh, and then, then go down to, okay, what should our top three priorities would be? Education, for me, would be one of them. Mm -hmm. And where are we out of alignment? And by the way, education system would be at the top. We are way out of alignment, and we're not talking about it at all. We're so busy fiddling with financial gimmickry, teacher comp, full day versus half day pre-K, affordable child care for at-risk women. Get back to basics. Right that grow the workforce, improve productivity, and we'll work our way. We're not gonna decline versus the rest of the world if we do that. If we're all focused on financial stuff uh, and take our eye off the ball, th then yeah, we may, we may uh, decline. That should not happen. We, we have the, we're, we've got a hand we're playing that, that we can win with this hand if we're focused on what makes us distinctive and are willing to take actions and make trade-offs mm -hmm. that invest in those things. I think that's really well said. Well, Rob, thank you very much for the time. We appreciate the friendship you have uh, with me and with our, with our entire firm. So, Always a pleasure. Thank you. Great to talk to you.